driest place in the driest country on earth. 130 years ago, there was gold in these hills. That's long gone. Now they've found liquid gold. They store it here. It's called Chardonnay. A revolution is taking place in the wine world. A torrent of wine from places you've hardly heard of is sweeping away the established order. New names are taking over. The cosy old world struggling to compete. Most of these new wines are called simply by the name of a grape, the chief influence on flavour. Understanding the main grapes makes wine make sense. And this one's the most popular, but probably least understood. the wine capital of Australia, the most confident nation in the challenging new world of wine. Over the last 20 years, the wine world's been turned upside down. France may produce many of the world's finest wines, but in the real commercial world of corks pulled and glasses poured down throats, French wine sales have been plummeting. As producers in places like California, South America, South Africa, and here in Australia, try that much harder to produce better wine with every vintage. Australia may only produce about a third as much wine as North America, but it exports far more, about one bottle in every four produced. And it has plans to virtually take over the wine drinking world. G'day, Joe, it's Jeff. How are you going? How did that Chardonnay go last night? Oh, good, so it's all picked now, it wasn't, yeah, right. Well, it wasn't all in when I left at two o'clock. Um, is the must tiller working on that now? What is the temperature? Shit, five, that's fantastic. Well, that's really good. Um, I don't Jeff Merrill may seem like an Aussie winemaker from Central Casting. He's also one of the most successful and most loved. In South Australia, wine's often made by phone. Winemaking by numbers. Okay, you've got those, and those other Chardonnays from uh, earlier in the week are at naught now, are they? All right, well, it sounds like you've got everything under control. I might go out for the rest of the day. Do you need me? No, just joking. Catch you later, mate. Uh, Australia is a fantastic place from the point of view of lifestyle, food, the wine we have, the way we live, terrific. But from a winemaking point of view, I mean, there's very few things that go wrong here. I mean, we talk about drought, but in droughts, you don't you don't lose quality. In fact, if anything, quality is sometimes enhanced, as we have great vintages and we have average vintages but we don't have disastrous vintages like they have in Europe created by rain at the wrong time and, and disease and things like that. There's everything we need here to grow um, some of the best grapes in the world and I think we do. Just south of Adelaide in McLaren Vale is Chateau Merrill. During the Southern Hemisphere's harvest or vintage time in March it's manned round the clock. No weekends off, no lunch breaks. The Australian way of winemaking is a very butch activity. Lots of hard physical work, long hours, and the very latest in boys' toys. But cleanliness is all, and the single most important winemaking tool is water. I respect the old world. I think there's a lot of... It's good, and I like giving them a bit of a rev, because some of them need it, you know. There's some great Frenchmen that I've had fun with, but there's, awful, there's some awfully closed shops there. Um, I mean, I think, we make, I think we make a lot of very good wine Australians. They don't regard us. Yet it's interesting that there's probably, um, I don't know how many young Australians making wine in France, because the French want to know what we're doing, because simply they don't know. 
in, uh, they don't know the technical side of things. The, the, the head of the cellar was their father and their grandfather before them, and it's all passed down. You know, you might have this moron that's a, a son that gets to become the head of the cellar. You know, it doesn't mean to say that he can make wine. And people are given the opportunity to make wine in this country on their ability. We are far more um, technically attuned. We, we want to know what's happening, the chemistry of our wine, from the vineyard to the finished product. Well, I think they take, they let nature have its way a lot, and nature doesn't, doesn't always do as it's told. But the Australians make sure that it does by controlling everything from the moment the grapes arrive, and by using additives such as special enzymes and yeast nutrients that most Frenchmen haven't even heard of. These are Chardonnay grapes, crucial to Australia's export success. Liquid sulfur's added to stop them oxidizing or turning brown. Leaves are known as MIG, or material other than grapes. With the stems, they're removed in this crusher and de-stemmer. And then everything's cooled like crazy to preserve the grapes' fresh, fruity flavors. An inflatable airbag inside this press, enclosed to keep that wicked oxygen out, squeezes juice out of the grapes as gently as possible to avoid any harsh flavors from the skins, which aren't needed for color in white wine. When pure juice, and not the cleaning water, begins to flow from the press, it's linked up to a tank. Here, the sweet grape juice will be fermented into dry, alcoholic wine, thanks to added, specially cultured yeasts. Okay. Refrigeration is the main reason why warmer regions, with their reliably ripe grapes, are now challenging northern Europe. New World winemakers like to keep oxygen out and temperatures so low that their wines can taste just too similar. Clean, fruity, but boring. OK, Joe, so you're happy with the basic blend structure that we've got, that we use perhaps... After about this. three weeks' fermentation, Chardonnays from different tanks are all candidates for the final blend. You probably bloody love it. It's your father-in-law, as you can't upset him. <laughs> Typically for an Australian winemaker, Jeff grows only a small portion of his grapes. The rest are bought in. Oh, that's fantastic. That's a bloody beauty. That's the Kunawara, I believe. Yeah, that's excellent. That's off your vineyards down there, that one. Yeah, that one. Well, I knew it'd have to be good. It's <laughs> off my vineyards. <laughs> we'll use We're allowed to put yours in there. <laughs> we'll use all of that. <laughs> Chardonnay is now the most popular wine in the world. In fact, for many, white wine is Chardonnay. 10%. Rough enough is good enough. I mean, we only have to be close. Yeah. The next one? 15. 15%. It's fashionable. It's been created by magazines and by movie stars, so it's fashionable. But it's easy to drink. You can refrigerate it, you can serve it at room temperature. And so those are the sort of things that I think that make it far more accessible than pretty well any other white wine variety. So that's what makes it popular. OK, this should add up to 100%. OK, 100%, rough enough. Okay. That's good. Brilliant. There's a common thread between the wine industries of the world, and the, the bottom line is that we're all winemakers, we all basically know what we're doing, and we all make wine. Some of us make it better than the others, but to put a stamp on yourself and say you're the best in the world leaves you open to be kicked down, I think, and the French have done that. And the new world is taking them on. And I think in taking them on in leaps and strides, and in lots of cases we beat them. In some cases we don't. But it's nice to be able to compete with them, and uh, we do. Now what we should do is just hold hands and have a glass of wine. It'll be a lot more fun. Well, I've got a bottle that will doubtless confirm all your prejudices about dirty French wine, as you Australians call it so often. What do you think? Mm. This is a Grand Cru Chablis, 1988, from a very famous grower. Um, probably cost about 20 quid, $40 a bottle. It's quite a lot of money, I think. Um, I think the wine has a lot of the, not the problems that we associate with it, but I think the wine is steely on the nose. So I, I would reject that straight away. Um, from, from a clinical tasting point of view, but... 
How about pleasure? I'd probably drink it, but then I've been known to drink anything at any time. <laughs> I'll swap this for a glass of my own Chardonnay. No, that'd be too parochial, and I don't want to sound like the French. <laughs> Burgundy, eastern France. In medieval villages like Merceau and Chablis to the north, hundreds of smallholders have been growing Chardonnay grapes for centuries, making savoury, full-bodied, world-famous, expensive, mostly overpriced, but sometimes breathtakingly subtle wines. Burgundy has many problems, but drought has never been one of them. Especially not this year. On the eve of harvest, it's been raining solidly for 11 days. Dominique Lafont is one of the region's most gifted winemakers. He's not a happy man. The rain presents Lafont with a real dilemma, not uncommon in Burgundy. If he picks now, the grapes will be swollen with rainwater, diluting the sugar and therefore potential alcohol. If he waits, hoping the grapes will ripen once more, he risks rot and disease. All he can do is to trudge through his different vineyards, checking the sugar levels, agonizing whether to call in his pickers or not. Nature also dominates back at the winery, a very new world word usually translated as carve. Everything's ready, if wet. The vintage was tremendous, uh, and, and then now it's getting more difficult. It doesn't mean we've lost everything, but uh, you have, it's, it's, it will be a more difficult work to, to get the best of summer and forget what happened uh, early September, all the rains. And it's now, it's a matter of, of uh, when to pick and how to pick. Wouldn't it be much easier to grow grapes in a nice, reliably sunny climate, somewhere like Australia or California? Could be, yes, when you have this kind of weather, maybe. But they have other problems, so... Um, it's, I think it's part, of, uh, it's part of Burgundy, it's part of uh, France, and the, the, the weather is different every year. Uh, we sometimes get beautiful weather, sometimes it's more difficult. There's, there's one thing which is uh, spectacular here, uh, it's, it's the soil and the vineyard uh, and the situation and all the story behind that and the knowledge we, we carry here, which you cannot find, I think, in other places of the world, and the peace. <laughs> <laughs> the peace makes the wine. I mean, no, here... No, it's, it's, it's a... You know, you don't just make wine because it's a wonderful area. Uh, it's very good living in Burgundy, too. And uh, maybe Why? it's good because it's small villages, it's quiet, uh, it's beautiful, and uh, maybe if you feel good, you work better. I like it here. These vineyards are here because it's, it's a tradition. There's been people working in these vineyards for centuries without making any money, and it's very recently that it started to go well. I bet even if with the worst crisis, you would still see vineyards here because there's so much history behind that. It's been going on forever, anyway. You don't actually consider you're making Chardonnay at all, do you? No, no. It's, we use Chardonnay to make um, also. It's very different. We're trying to achieve something which might be more difficult, is to get all the, 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 the things which are in the ground and in the ambience here, in the air, through the fruit and then through the wine. Uh, so there's, uh, there's something of uh, um, what I would call a spirit, maybe, in the wine, uh, which, which we have to catch through all the work we do. The next day, Dominique Lafont decides to pick. He was right, it rained the next week, too. Despite the climate, in fact, because the grapes tend to be longer on the vine, ripening and developing real character, there are great raw materials in Burgundy. But there are still far too few people like Lafont who know how to transform them into reliably delicious wine. Mm. 
lunchtime. Into the press, quite open to the atmosphere because Burgundians see oxygen as an aid to developing more complex flavours. The pickers return for their lunch. At this time of year, Merceau Village Shop's best sellers are rubber boots. No added yeast here, and mechanical harvesters don't sing either. Tell me, what, what is this then? So, this so you're is... not as disappointed as you thought you might be after uh, this No, uh, it's going to be good when it could have been uh, outstanding. Good to very good, I don't know. But it's the looks, the, the juice are good, they look good, they're green, they're very pale, and it's, it's ripe, it's 12, 12 and a half everywhere right now. That's not a, the, as ripe as some years? Yeah, some years we get to 13 mm -hmm. or 13 and a half, but it's all right. It's, the acidities are very good, which is important. The balance is good. Can I taste? Yes. You, you can do a blind tasting. Either tell me which is the best, and I'll tell you if it's the best vineyard. <laughs> or this is Moaché, Chambier Vigne, and Claude Labar. Well, if you don't mind, if it's not going to send you into penury, can I have a little drop of Moaché juice? Go ahead. Thanks. Now, this, this is something like 50 quid a bottle or more when it's made. Why am I spitting it for heaven's sake? Good, you're a genius. You're a genius. No doubt about it. Now, tell me what you think of this one. This is something from Come another on. planet. <laughs> something, a Chardonnay from Australia that the British love. Mm -hmm. But it perhaps oughtn't to share a glass with your Monash juice. It's going to be tough, this <laughs> sugar. <laughs> Some corked. Corked? No? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. It's uh, Australian Chardonnay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I think you've said everything. Mm. Let me say that. <laughs> well, he might not think it fit even to spit in his cellar, but it's Britain's most popular brand of bottled wine. Australian Chardonnay's easy, open, predictable style has driven the country's wine boom even though South Australia produced its first commercial Chardonnay as recently as the early 80s. Adam Wynne's father was the man responsible. Adam now makes one of Australia's most Burgundian Chardonnays. I think Chardonnay is a variety it's sort of all things to all people. Um, it has a very nebulous group of flavours. They're not very specific. And it means that no one can find anything to dislike. <laughs> um, you may have a variety like Sauvignon Blanc or Gouet's Tramina. And either you love that flavour or you hate it. 
There is Chardonnay, um, you see in it what you want to see in it. Now, you must never underestimate, however, fashion in all of this, and fashion plays a huge role in the wine industry. Varieties come and go as fashion changes. In fact, it can be quite annoying for the winemaker because you never know which, quite which way to look. Um, suddenly everybody's wanting one style of wine or one variety, and then all of a sudden they want something else. And in the meantime, of course, you've planted vineyards which take years and years to come into production. The family wine estate, high in the cool hills above Adelaide, was named after Adam Wynne, who now runs it. So all of this you can see here is Mount Adam. God. I mean, there must be masses of bits of Australia waiting to be discovered that would make great vineyard sites. There's there? a lot of areas, but the key to it is water. Um, you have to have good water to grow grapevines in Australia. And what we do here is we grow grapevines on certain parts of the farm, but the vast majority of it is used as water catchment for the vineyard, perhaps up to 90%. So you're basically farming water more often than you're farming grapes. That's right, exactly, <laughs> and it's the key to most of Australia. With water you can do anything, um, but of course you have to have enough rainfall for that to happen. So up here on this ridge uh, we get a good rainfall effect, we get about 35 inches, but as you go that way the rainfall drops off dramatically. In fact those hills in the distance um, get about half the rain that we get here. Okay. So it, it really is the key, um, rainfall is everything. Do you have a raincoat? No. I've got one locked away in a cupboard somewhere, but I don't think I've worn it in 10 years. <laughs> All Australian winemakers go to college, but Adam's unusual in having studied at Bordeaux University, the French wine course. He came top and then worked in Burgundy. The thing is that I get very annoyed with the situation in France in that people are often handed good grapes on a platter and famous appellations and then mess them up in the winemaking. Um, if you were born lucky enough to inherit three hectares of Merceau, it's a license to print money, really. The world beats a path to your door. Um, you don't have to do a lot of work to look after three hectares of vines. There's plenty of weeks in the year when you can be playing ball or chasing the neighbor's wife or doing whatever else you want to do to pursue a Burgundian lifestyle. But the thing is that people are handed this gift from God, if you like, and then mess it up. And I find it personally a tragedy when you taste a bad French wine from a great appellation because people who have had everything in their favour have missed the opportunity. But there is one respect, isn't there, in which you are totally dependent on the French? Oh yes, indeed. We get all of our barrels from France. <laughs> growth areas in the French wine industry are forests full of wine barrels to be. The world's wine producers just can't get enough French oak because forests here in central France have been so well looked after and because oak flavours go so well with wine. In fact, many people who think they like Chardonnay may really be in love with oak. Barrels, or so much cheaper, added oak chips. Il a quel âge, cet arbre? Environ 150 ans. 150, mais c'est tellement petit. Oui, mais c'est pour ça qu'il est de bonne qualité, parce que le, le grain est très fin, il a poussé très doucement. Un arbre comme ça euh, grossit d'un centimètre et demi par année. Et c'est ça qui donne sa qualité. Ah uh ah. -huh. Je pense que c'est sur le point de, de, de tomber. tomber. Oui, oui, va tomber, là. Ouh. Voilà. Et combien de barriques on peut, on peut en faire de, de ça euh, Environ deux. Environ deux. Que deux Que deux, que deux. D'un grand deux. arbre comme ça ah Oui, deux barriques finies, terminées. Ouh. Environ deux. J'espère qu'on qu renouvelle la forêt tout le temps. Hein. La, la forêt se régénère naturellement. Uh -huh. Elle repousse euh, d'elle-même. Uh -huh. Et combien euh, vaut-il tout ce bois-là Un arbre comme ça vaut euh, environ 4000 francs. 4 000 francs. 800 dollars. Beaucoup, hein Oui, c'est beaucoup. Mais il y en a qui valent beaucoup plus. Ouf. The 
degree of charring, light, medium or heavy toast, has become all important, especially to American winemakers who've come to believe it's their magic ingredient. C'est très facile. Vous-même, vous ressentez le, le goût vanillé, hey, pas brûlé. On se croirait un petit peu de, dans le four du boulanger. Hmm? Je peux Je vous en prie. <laughs> Spice, I think. Un peu épicé, peut-être. Un peu épicé, oui. un peu plus épicé. Oui. Un peu oui. plus épicé, oui. épicé oui. ça convient mieux au pinot noir. Mais comme euh, nous fabriquons beaucoup de, de barriques pour, pour le chardonnay, euh, pour le chardonnay, nous utilisons la plupart du temps des bois avec un, un grain serré et avec un brûlage médium, médium moins. So great is California demand for Jean-Francois barrels that, like other French coopers, he set up a cooperage here, just north of Fog City, to keep diners like these in their favorite white wine. It's extraordinary the extent to which Chardonnay has colonized American wine culture. Look at this typical restaurant wine. It's actually it's a very good restaurant wine list. White wine in total is represented by at least 40 American Chardonnays, six out of seven of the world whites, because they're white burgundies, so they're made from Chardonnay, leaving just 12 representatives of the non-Chardonnay world of white wine. It's weird that everyone's so crazy about Chardonnay. I bet they'd be hard pressed to describe its flavor, because Chardonnay is actually rather a neutral grape variety. It just does what the winemaker tells it to do and has a convenient affinity with oak. Chardonnay is relatively alcoholic, which may explain some of its appeal. Not just the effect, but alcohol actually tastes pleasantly sweet. And some winemakers even deliberately sweeten up their cheaper Chardonnays to give them mass market appeal. You may gather that I'm slightly cynical about the Chardonnay boom. At its worst, Chardonnay is just a sweet and sour mixture of alcohol and water. At its best, it's a magnificent, dry, intense expression of place and faultless winemaking that's all too rare. And in the great commercial middle ground between these two extremes, Chardonnay is quite simply the world's favorite wine. <laughs> 